welcome to the Institute always to our second meeting this year of the colloquium. In this school, the souls and sounds of the city, the colloquium started, was launched yesterday, last year, and um, we continue this year with several scholarly um, uh, lectures, and hopefully it will uh, go on. We're very happy to have everyone here. We have also guests on Zoom. And uh, our um, uh, guest today is um, Dr. Nathan Ron uh, from the University of Haifa. And I just want to uh, present Dr. Ron in a, few, in a couple of words. His research deals with uh, key Renaissance scholars, particularly Erasmus of Rotterdam. And uh, Dr. Ron also studies inter interreligious relationship in early modern Europe. And his present research, which he's going to present, part of it he's going to present today, focus on the uh, Jewish-Christian dialogue between scholars in early modern uh, Germany. And uh, Dr. Ron is also the author of several books, including Erasmus and the Other, on Turks, Jews, Amerindians, and indigenous people, and um, Erasmus intellectual of the 16th century. This Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, in a personal tone, I have to. Uh, I need to 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 say a few words. Uh, um, it's been the last summer has been the five hundredth anniversary of uh, Reuchlin's death. Um, Yeah, I mentioned it. And it, for me, it was, uh, I felt I have a commitment to commemorate uh, this. And I, I think I really did a few important things. One of them is translating uh, Reuchlin's uh, Ratschler is uh, expert opinion, which is part of the Augenspiegel, uh, the most important part, the heart of the whole issue of, uh, you know, the plot to burn uh, the Jewish books, Talmud, and I will talk about it later on. Anyway, this was one contribution uh, it came out just a few months ago, four or five months ago. And I also published a few papers. One of them was translated to German. I think you, you know the one. But there's another one in English coming up. Uh, the same issue. Reuchlin is a public intellectual, which I think is uh, an original, my original, point of view of uh, Reuchlin. Uh, and uh, so uh, I'm quite content with that, with the fact that uh, be, I, I, I did, well, I made some significant contribution to the uh, 500 uh, anniversary of Reuchlin's death. I, and, and to uh, get people to know uh, a little bit more about Reuchlin, because I think most of, most of the people that I talk to, they know about Erasmus. They heard about Erasmus, but many uh, did not hear about Reuchlin, even in Germany. I spoke to German people who haven't heard anything about uh, Reuchli. And it's really a pity. So uh, uh, maybe uh, the conference that was held in the summer in Germany and a few publications and the newspapers covered it as well in Germany. So maybe uh, all these uh, brought up the issue of uh, Reuchlin's uh, 
uh, role as a scholar, as a Hebraist, and as a defender of the Hebrew language, Hebrew culture, and Jews. So uh, uh, what, what I do here in my presentation is I start with Reuchlin, and then I move to Erasmus, uh, and I do some kind of uh, comparison between the two concerning their attitude to the Hebrew language and to Judaism. Uh, such a comparison uh, is uh, uh, emphasizing is uh, shedding light uh, on both, both of them, on Erasmus and on Roy. And uh, it so happened that I just returned from Krakow, Poland. I spent a few weeks at the library, university's library in Krakow. And many of the uh, slides here, and the books that you can see are fresh, taken from Krakow. I took, took the photos in Krakow. But this one, for example, the Verbo Miritico uh, on the Wonder Working World, uh, this is a first edition, which I held in my hand. And, uh, I looked after that. It, uh, you can buy it for some five to seven thousand uh, dollars. So uh, this is the first edition, fourteen hundred ninety-four. Um, is actually his first Kabbalistic work, Reuchlin's Kabbalistic work, the first one. The second one was the Arte Kabbalistica, which was later came out later. And you can notice you, you can notice that the publisher is the same one, and all over my presentation, you will notice it. Uh, Thomas Anschen, and they started. Uh, you can see here, they started in Basel. Sorry, uh, this is Amabat in Basel, but here you have Anshin here in uh, Hagenau, but you will have more Anshins uh, in other places. I will uh, point out later on. But Anshin became his home uh, publishing uh, house. And he's really uh, well, colleague printer, and Anshin uh, shared his uh, his views, his uh, 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 conceptions of Kabbalah, mostly. I will point out that later on. If you, by the way, if you have question. Or remarks during during uh, my talk, it I don't mind. Ah, okay. That's that's also from Krakow, straight from my visit uh, at the library in Krakow. You see, uh, that that's another. Um, Another book by Reutlin, the, very, uh, the same one actually, the, the Vero Meritico that I pointed, pointed to, uh, but this one is a later edition from 1514, the same Thomas Anschen, but here he is in Tübingen. Later on, he moved to Hagenau, today France. Uh, as us. Uh, and as I said, uh, he was the colleague printer of uh, partner, actually, of uh, uh, Erasmus had the same 
kind of arrangement in Basel. He had Froben. Froben in Basel was his home publishing house. And Froben was kind of partner for Erasmus. So this is quite typical. Uh, to be a printer at those days, as you may know, is not just a technical issue. It's a printer is a man of letters and a man of books. And uh, 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 in all, you know, in order to to print somebody's book, he has to well, if not to identify with the book and its contents, to have some kind of uh, appreciation of the book. Uh, this is Reuchling's coat of arms. He got it uh, in 1492. Uh, Erasmus didn't have any. In that respect, Reuchling was nobility and Erasmus was not. Um, uh, you, interesting to notice the Ara Capnionis, the altar of Capnio. Capnio, Capnio was Reutling's humanistic name. And you have the explanation of the name Little Smoke. Yes. Uh, this one, as I said, from fresh from Clapo, and it has some kind of handwriting inscribed here, which is still has to be uh, you know to to uh, to read and understand because it's not easy to understand, but it, it's, it's not Reutling, but it's a probably 16th century uh, handwriting, and it has to do with the stuff that Reutling is dealing with. Latin. That, that, that's Latin, yes, that's Latin. And the stuff is God's name, the Dragamaton, Yes, Jehovah here. Yeah. I will come to it later. I hope. Uh, did I have it before? Yeah, I have it here. Let me. Uh, the idea is uh, the verb political, yes. The idea is that uh, uh, that the ineffable name of God in the form of the Jewish tetragrammaton Yehova uh, became effable since it has been transformed with the insertion of the medium Shin, yeah, the letter Shin, into a pentagrammaton, that meaning Yehova became Yehoshua. Something like that. The, this, uh, the Reutling uh, was toying with with this uh, stuff, and this is the uh, verbo meritico, uh, the tetragrammaton that turned into a pentagrammaton with the addition of the letter shin. Uh, when I said toying, uh, he, of course, did, for him, it was not toying. It was serious stuff for him. <laughs> I can't, I can't stop uh, referring to it as toying because it, it, it's, it doesn't make sense. In terms of Hebrew uh, meaning, it, it's impossible. This has a, they, they have two different roots and two different meanings. And uh, Roy could do better than that. Uh, and by the way, Erasmus, who didn't like Kabbalah, this really distasted, distasted Kabbalah, 
and uh, wrote it very ex expressively. Uh, well, in, in such a case, Erasmus was right. This is really uh, out of place. This is something quite uh, interesting, I think. Leuchlin translated a Hebrew moral book by the name of Kealarata uh, Kesa, the Silver Bow, uh, which is uh, like, if you, you know, proverb, Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, something like that. Uh, written by uh, Yosef and the man, the man. He, he has a short name as well, Yosef and Zobi. And uh, this is uh, the opening page of the Leuchlin's translation. And uh, this, this is interesting because uh, Sometimes we have uh, scholars argue uh, over the question of his Hebraism. Was his Hebraism instrumental or was there something else beside that? Instrumental in the sense that he, he wanted and studied it and researched it in order to, to use it for Christianity, for, to, to, uh, to form uh, a Christian Kabbalah and uh, uh, to find out, to prove Christian truth out of Jewish sources. That's the instrumental attitude. And no doubt he had an instrumental attitude, but I think there was there was something else beside that. And this that's an example, I think. That's an example. Uh, to translate such a moral uh, Hebrew book uh, into Hebrew. Uh, it's, it's not just, I, I, I don't think there's uh, only uh, the, the, uh, uh, the benefit of Christianity that he had in mind. Although there was something else which I need to, uh, to mention, I haven't mentioned it yet. It's the Pfefferkorn Reuchlin affair it was already going on in 15. And one of the intentions that Reuchlin had, and he, I, as far as I remember, he also wrote it, is to say something like, if Pfefferkorn, the one who wanted to destroy the Hebrew books that I mentioned, Reuchlin's rival. If Pepperton had, if he could have a father like Rabbi, uh, what's his name? Yosef Ben Haname, then there wouldn't be, then Pepperton wouldn't have been the same man as he is. That, then there wouldn't be any problem going on in Germany and elsewhere because of that Pfefferkorn Reutling. Uh, this is uh, a bit uh, weird. I think Reutling wanted, perhaps he wanted to experience or to practice uh, translating of this kind of literature, of Hebrew literature. Um, Perhaps, perhaps there was something else, but anyway, this is this is not about really uh, 
Christian benefit. I, I don't think that it's about Christian benefit. Uh, it's not Kabbalah. Uh, Kabbalah, you can, you can, uh, you can come to uh, Christian benefit out of Kabbalah, yes, but not this kind of literature. Um, this is uh, uh, it's uh, watered a lot, Reuchlin, uh, but then I think Luther also used this sentence: the Hebrews drink from the sources, the Greeks from the rivers, the Latin people from the swamps, the very people from the Greeky rivers, Latini from the and it, uh, as you can understand, it uh, expresses Reuchlin. Ad Fontes attitude to go as far as Hebrew in order to be able to both read scriptures and to uh, you know to, uh, to to discover Christian truth to prove Christian truth. I I have to say also that Reuchlin. Uh, uh, very well, openly uh, talked or uh, wrote about uh, the need to uh, get the Jews converted. Uh, he wanted the Jews convert to Christianity, but he emphasized that this should not be done by uh, using any force or pressure. This should be done gently by discussion, by showing them the right way and so on. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, those who, who are, uh, some, some of the uh, uh, scholars that deal with Reuven, they say he wanted, that, he wanted the Jews converted so He's, he was not on their side. Oh, he was not philosemitic because he wanted them that he was converted to Christianity. But I think, I think he was for the Jews, not again there. And he was philosemitic in his attitude. Uh, the fact that he wanted the Jews converted uh, does not contradict uh, the fact that he was philosophical in his attitude. Okay. So this is uh, the silver vowel. That's, of course, Hebrew, the Hebrew text. And that's the Latin. The, this is the closing page of the Latin. Now, if you read, the Hebrew, can you read Hebrew? Uh, yeah? Well, Resum Colonae, Shalosh Atarotem, Shalosh Atarotem, Resum Colonae, Veshem Tov Alei Nechis. This is human, but should be known. Uh, Nomen ad bonum illum corona. Boni to super ad corona. Uh, atara, atara. Yatref uh, ketsina el. Deus el gotes kuto so corona. And so on. In other words, if you read the Hebrew and you look at the Latin, to me, at least, as one who reads Hebrew and reads the Bible in Hebrew, it doesn't, in Yiddish, it doesn't work. It doesn't work well. Uh, well, I don't know, maybe because of the, you know, the Latin is quite rigid and 
because of that maybe it, it i i can it's it's not a good translation maybe uh, there's no other way to translate it but it, it, it yeah the stiffness and rigidity of the latin is very uh, uh, dominant and uh, the Hebrew, <laughs> the biblical language, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, um, it works, of course. Uh, again, this, this is the, we mentioned Thomas Hanschen, of the same printer as well, and uh, Intigingen. And again, look, I told you, uh, this printer shared Reutlin's convictions, and you can see it in his logo. This is uh, Anshan's logo. You have T, Thomas, Anshan, and B for Badensis. He came from Baden, from the original Baden. So this is his logo, and look here. You have the, what's that? The pentagrammaton that I showed you at the beginning, the tetragrammaton that became pentagrammaton, so you have the pentagrammaton, the sheen uh, yeah, added to the. So he, they shared the same idea. Anshan followed Reuchlin in that respect. It's great when you have a publisher that follows your. Your ideas, even in his logo. What we would praise the Hebrew, Hebrew must be kissed tenderly and embraced with both arms, uh, it, because it's the word that God spoke when he spoke without any translator and so on. Um, I should mention here a, an important researcher. He's, he's, German. he's German, but he lives in the United States. I know, I know him personally, his name is Franz Posset. And he, among other things, he wrote, he wrote uh, Reuchlin's biography, some thousand pages. He uh, was in Pforzheim looking through the archive. In Pforzheim is uh, Reuchlin's uh, hometown in Germany. Uh, for a few years, he sat there and, uh, and, he, came, and, and he, came, uh, he came with a book, with that book, some thousand pages. So uh, this is actually, I uh, relied a lot on Posset. But we should, a guy that I know personally and I cooperate with him quite a lot. Uh, this is interesting in my mind. Reuchlin wrote, Reuchlin knew Hebrew quite well. And he wrote uh, a few letters in Hebrew. Uh, this is one of them. This is a letter that he wrote in Hebrew to one of his uh, Hebrew teachers. He had a few. Uh, and this, th this one was the most important one. His name was Lowens, Yaakov ben Yechiel Lowens. Um, and uh, they had a very good connection uh, and uh, years later, years later, Reutlin wrote to him to tell him that he's doing very well in Hebrew, that the teacher can be proud of the student. So he wrote in Hebrew. I shall read it in Hebrew, okay? Shalom, shalom, l'arachok v'lakarov. Adoni Rabbi Yaakov Alufi Umeyudei. He's writing, he's the Christian, writing to a Hebrew guy. Adoni 
‫אבי יעקב אלופי ומיודעי, ‫ממני המשתוקק והנכסף ‫לראות פניך, ‫eager to see your face. ‫בשלוקק <laughs> 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 Also, the expression, beautiful expression, Megillat Sefer Lodiacha Ki Shevach Nael Achrei Nosei Mincha Itzlachti Belimudai Veigati Lachsaga Gdola Yadati Tismach Vetagil I want to make you happy Ani Yochanan Rothlin Mifortzen ‫הכותב ראש חודש כסלו, ‫שנת כ"א סמ"א, ‫ליד נכבד רבי יעקב, ‫כבוד מורי ורבי. ‫כבוד מורי ורבי, יחיה לורנט. ‫ביוטפול לטר, ‫והוא כתב כמה. And longer ones as well in Hebrew. Uh, by the way, other, uh, other Hebrews that I study also wrote letters in Hebrew, both to rabbis and among themselves, to each other. How, how much is his Hebrew biblical and how much is it missionary? I don't know. I, I didn't I, I didn't check this. This is very biblical. This is very biblical. biblical. Yeah. I I think if I should answer here on the spot, I think biblical, because uh, he mentions uh, the, there's one a long one that he wrote. I have it uh, later on, maybe that he wrote to the popes. Physician who was a Jew by the name of uh, his name was uh, Bonnet de Lat, Bonnetus de Lat, or Bonnet de Lat, and he had a Hebrew name also. I forgot the Hebrew name. Anyway, he was the Pope's uh, physician, he was a Jew, and uh, Reuchlin was in troubles with Pfefferkorn, was the whole issue. Uh, going on, and he was put to trial, Warichli, actually, in Germany. So he wrote to Bonnetella in order that he, and he probably, we don't know if he knew him before that. Maybe he didn't know the guy at all, but he wrote to him in order to ask him to ask for Warichli, to, to ask the Pope that this trial should not be in that city, but in that city. Yeah, in order that he will help him to get help from, uh, and it's a long letter and he uh, very much sounds like, parts of it uh, sounds like Megillat Esther. Yeah, yeah, like that. Uh, so I think more biblical. If, uh, he did, Reuchlin did not really know the Talmud. He, he probably didn't read it. He knew what is it, what it's about, but he didn't read it and he explains about it. He says even Jews, it's difficult for them to read the Talmud and not many of them read the Talmud. So I think we can say quite, you know, uh, we can be quite sure about it, uh, biblical, uh, not, not Talmudic in that, in that sense, yeah. He didn't, he didn't know the, he didn't really know the Talmud. Mm -hmm.
<laughs> probably, probably also, I don't think. The Esther, of course, is late for the book. It is, it, it is already in the direction of. Um, yeah, but uh, you know the holy tongue, holy tongue, the Hebrew that they used was very much uh, in the in the style. Of, although Reutlin is is he excels. I mean, I read others which use holy that use holy tongue. Other Hebrews like Kaspar Amman and others they wrote uh, letters in Hebrew. And uh, Reutlin excels. Okay, so uh, I think this is quite impressive. And for me, this is also, uh, you know, as I told you, was he, was it sheer instrumentalism or was it something, or was there something else? Uh, except, I think it's not just instrumental. From this letter, you can see he's falling in love with language. You can say he is falling in, in love with the language. Yeah, he 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 said that about Hebrew. Yeah. So uh, was the issue? What issue? Is that? Yeah, he was now. The point, my point when I wrote about Roitlin was not uh, linguistic uh, uh, issues. Or I, well, my point was uh, his uh, Roitlin as a public intellectual. To me, this is something that really the most impressive thing about him: the fact that he stood up to fight. Uh, against uh, the plot to burn the Jewish books, and by that he, well, protected the Jewish people, uh, its existence. Um, and in that sense, he was a human rights fighter. And I, what I tried to do by showing that, I, I tried to put him closer to the Enlightenment. Uh, Guys, you know, who were public intellectuals and you know, human rights, uh, uh, who was always who was starting to develop the uh, fact. And uh, by the Jews, the Jews who wrote, the Jews appreciated working very much. We have uh, uh, quotations of, of what they said and wrote about working. They appreciate very much what he, done, he has done for them. Uh, they use this expression, righteous among nations, about royalty. So this is interesting. <laughs> so now we come to the Reutling uh, Peppercorn affair, the plot uh, to burn the Talmud and other Jewish books, not the Bible, not the Hebrew Bible. Uh, Peppercorn was the man behind the plot, was his idea. Um, he was supported mainly by uh, a group, a bunch of theologians from Köln, the Dominican, uh, scholastic theologian of Kern, the Uni University of Kern. Uh, and uh, since Reutling stood up against him, a fight started of pamphlets and, or as I said, Reutling was even put to, to trial and he was in real danger. And the book that Reutlin uh, published, but first, before the book, I will just go on to the next slide. Uh, so these are uh, the figures that were involved, uh, the popes and the emperor at that time, 
And what happened was that the, the emperor um, who supported the plot, burn the books at the beginning, uh, later on changed his mind and actually formed a committee, uh, members of uh, representatives of four uh, uh, universities and three, uh, three persons, one of them was Leuchling, the other, this guy, Victor von Kamen, was probably a, a rabbi converted to Christianity. I say probably because he testified that he was rabbi. We are not completely sure about him. Uh, and uh, Reutling uh, was the, and, and Jack, sorry, the third one was Hochstraten, Hochstraten or Hochstan, who was both a theologian and an inquisitor at, in this area. And, uh, uh, and uh, Reuchlin was the only one who said, don't burn the book. So recommended not to burn the book. He wrote his expert opinion, which I mentioned. Uh, and it's, it's uh, to be found in the Avinch figure, is the book that he uh, wrote later. Uh, so, uh, this is, this is the detailed and well reasoned opinion that I uh, pointed. And this is the Arvin Spiegel, which has the expert opinion. You see, Arvin Spiegel. Uh, the same uh, Thomas Anshin. <laughs> And uh, it was burned, of course, the guys from Kern, the scholastic theologian, and Fepacon didn't like it. And it was burned in Kern, as far as I remember, uh, in, uh, uh, I don't know, remember exactly what it was burned as an act of uh, protest against or against uh, the book and against this expert opinion. Um, uh, now, my point is that Reutling is a public intellectual. Uh, Reutling was deeply involved in that. I told you he was in danger. He was in real danger. But Erasmus, what about Erasmus? Erasmus was the number one scholar at that time. He was the prince of humanists. That was his uh, title. That's how they called him. Uh, what about him? We would expect Erasmus to have a, well, if not to be involved, to have a standing on that. Some kind of standing. Uh, Erasmus say, I uh, said, I am not a Reuchlings. I am a Christian and I do what the best, whatever is best for Christianity. I, I do not take sides. I'm not going to take side in this contro controversy. Yes, I'm not going to take any side. Uh, something like that. Sorry. Uh, it would it wouldn't be the first time because something like that he refused to translate uh Douglas Tratate captured about the monarchy because it might I mean it might bring uh political problems to him. I mean he he, he took care a lot you mean Erasmus? Yeah he took he took he took care a lot of, of his full image like he yeah, he didn't for, I mean, yeah, yeah. Public, his public image was very important to him. Yes, yeah. that's true. But you would expect an intellectual, you know, uh, to take to take part. It, it's it is about Christianity. It is about Judaism. It, it it's the issue of the hour. 
It, and uh, Erasmus uh, was involved in other issues when he wanted to, and, uh, and he could be very brave as well, Erasmus. Writing the his novel instrumentum that is huh? I have to finish. Yeah. I didn't get got as far as Erasmus. Okay. Uh, so anyway, I have to to move fast now to Erasmus, right? Anyway, as I said, Erasmus preferred not to be involved. Oh, Erasmus knew Reutlin very well. It's not that Reutlin was somebody uh, was foreign or anything, not at all. And, uh, but he preferred not to be involved. So the public arena was left for Reutlin. And he really acted as a public intellectual. This, uh, this is the English, the English, there are two English translations. This one is the Avinch figure, the entire Avinch figure, including the Reutlin's Ratschlag. This is uh, only Reutlin's Ratschlag. This is a French translation which just came out a few, well, maybe a year ago or so. New one. Uh, this is mine. Uh, there are a few uh, very important assertions uh, of Reutlin that I think we must read it. Uh, the Jew is one of our uh, Lord God's creatures just as much as I am. He said that in his uh, expert opinion. Erasmus would never say something like that, believe me. I, I researched that and wrote, well, two books. Uh, and then the uh, purpose uh, of Corinthians part 12, uh, that they are not the Jews, members of the Christian church, and thus their beliefs are of no consequence to us. That is, we have no problem with them. Should, we should not burn their books or anything like that. And they are subject. He said that that was that, that is also very important. Conquivers. They are equal subjects of the Roman Empire, of the Holy Roman Empire. Therefore, we should treat them just as we treat any other uh, subject of uh, the uh, empire. Uh, and it means we should not uh, uh, confiscate their property, private property, including books, yes, their books and so on. And he said that in his uh, uh, expert opinion. That was really, really unexceptional. I mean, exceptional, of course, very exceptional. Uh, I know my adversaries, Pepper Conan and the Kern the, the theologian, are dismayed because I have called them Jews. I call them Jews, our fellows, our fellow citizens. Now I would want them to go ber berserk even more. The guts may burst open because I say that. The Jews are our brother. You want them to explode, those Kel uh, guys, to explode. You said that, like that. So now I move to Erasmus and his attitude. First of all, I mentioned that, that he didn't want to be involved and to support Reuchlin in this uh, controversy. And, and uh, well, he didn't want the Jews in Europe. So that, these are quotes. He wanted Europe devoid of Jews, empty of Jews. I don't want to say that in German. 
but you know what I mean. It doesn't sound good. And to those who love Erasmus and appreciate him, it's very difficult. I just came from uh, Rotterdam. I've been there a few months ago. I had to argue about that. They wouldn't accept it. They are the guardians of the seal, Rotterdam, Rasmus hometown. So, but he, he wrote it more than once, twice, and even there's a third time here. Now, of course, Reuchlin wanted just the opposite. He wanted the Jews in Europe. He wanted Europe with Jews. It was important for him to have the Jews in Europe because of their contribution to Christianity, because of, of their uh, uh, link to Christianity, because of their uh, language and culture and books and everything. Um, yeah, so I will... Okay. Erasmus tried to study Hebrew. He started, was too difficult, he explained. The language was strange and difficult. So he preferred to concentrate on Greek, ancient Greek, and he did very well. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, uh, this is, Another one by Roy Klinger, who we named this varieties. It's about the fundamentals of the Hebrew language. Right. And uh, later on, uh, Erasmus somehow changed his mind and recommended to study Hebrew. For theologians, he said, theologians, Christian, they should learn Hebrew as well. But he said, the uh, young people should be aware of Hebrew. Read this. Should be aware of Hebrew. Could be dangerous. That's it. I uh, my last slide, I think. Yeah, that's my last slide. Get the. Uh, he said. Uh, very nicely said, uh, who can be compared to him to Reutling? A miracle in his time. And George Steiner said about Judaism, not about Reutling, that Judaism is about reading text and reading and again, memorizing and so on. And Amos Oz and Fanny Oz, they have a very nice book called uh, Jews and words, uh, they touch upon this uh, point, uh, elaborating on Jewish textual survival as a national survival. And it's national survival. And I think Reutling contributed a lot to that survival, to that Jewish survival, actually national survival. At the end, it's national survival. Thank you very much. If you have questions, <laughs> ah, just one. The the last one is very nice. You should see the last one. This one was on Twitter. It's uh, the Catholic University of Louvain, so it's Flemish. Must be Flemish. It it says, uh, "Be smarter or wiser than <laughs> study." <laughs> Okay, we have to, uh, time for maybe two or three questions, and then we can continue with the tea and coffee. Any questions from the audience? Yes, please. Uh, I have one remark on Erasmus. Uh, here in the city of Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York, there's uh, the one of the oldest high schools in Erasmus High School, Erasmus Hall. Two of the famous students from Erasmus Hall was the Jewish Bible. Uh, there's a Jewish Bible, Barbara Streisand. And the anti-Semite, Bobby Petra. Sorry, I, I didn't yeah, maybe get maybe the name. I didn't get the name. Yes, it's uh, <laughs> the Bible. 
It's, uh, it's my hearing, oh, not yours. Yes. Okay. In uh, Brooklyn, Erasmus Hall High School. Yeah, I know that. I know about that. Uh, the yeah. Jewish file, Barbara Streisand, and the anti Semite Bobby Investor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, the Jew anti Semite. Yeah, right. the Jew anti Semite. Okay, have a question from the Zoom audience. First of all, thank you for your uh, writing's character and writings uh, to our attention. Uh, I at least must admit that I didn't know much about him. I just wanted to ask two questions if possible. Did you say you had written a book about the writing? Could you please confirm if I understand it correctly? And in your estimation, are there any other figures? After Roykin, they have shared his outlook uh, that you could rec uh, recommend investigating. Are there any uh, followers of Roykin who follow yeah. his step that you can recommend to investigate their contribution? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I uh, I mentioned one name, a very important name, Kaspar Aman, a German uh, Hebraist. Uh, less known than Reutlin, but very important. And there's a paper, there's a an article, a paper. Uh, it will come out in a few months, written by myself and Franz Posset. It's about that, exactly about Kaspar Amann and other Johannes Bessenstein. I didn't, I, 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 I went, no, but he's there. Uh, Johannes Bessenstein is also very important. So Kaspar Amann, Johannes Bessenstein, and there are a few, a few more, not many, who knew Hebrew, we, who even wrote letters among themselves and to rabbi, they were in connection with Jewish rabbis, and Jewish booksellers, uh, suppliers, and, and they exchange letters in Hebrew with them. And our paper is about these connections, is about this dialogue. Kaspar Amann, Johannes Bessenstein, and a few more, it will, it will uh, come out uh, in uh, the June, what's uh, 16th century journal. Isn't it that Philip Melanchthon was also a yes. pupil of, and I think he managed his relative. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I tried to, uh, uh, to follow the connection exactly. It's very difficult to. Voltim uh, was his, somehow his cousin, and not cousin, his uncle, uncle, second uncle. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and but Voitling also kind of adapted him when Melanchthon, Melanchthon he became orphan in a very young age, so he was brought to Paul time and put uh, and I think it was Voitling uh, I don't know Voitling's family they took care of him. And Reutling was some kind of uh, platform for him and guide, spiritual guide, so to speak. Yes. Uh, and there was a very good connection between them, yes. very important. Yes. And Martin Luther, he didn't adopt Reutling's uh, studies and ideas. And, and I think uh, that um, many things would have developed so differently um, if Martin Luther had relied on Reutling's. Uh, scholarship. Although uh, Luther yeah. did, did attribute uh, yeah. importance to the Hebrew language, yeah, and, uh, but you're right in terms of uh, attitude towards the Luther had it thought that the Jews will convert. You know, we have two Luthers. The early one, yes. the early one was more moderate, still had hopes that the Jews will convert to his yeah. Protestant Christian. Yeah. Yeah, but once that didn't happen, then we have another group uh, very much uh, because of the bad influence of a Jewish convert by the name of Margarita, uh, who was a Luther's uh, Hebrew teacher and was, uh, was a guy like, well, like Pepperton maybe, 
he uh, he was quite quite uh, responsible for the bad influence that Luther brought uh, at, at that time. <laughs> So what was the outcome? I think uh, this guy, this guy over there. I was wondering if there was a, a Karaite influence at all um, in, in Europe with the attitude that they wouldn't burn the, the Hebrew Bibles, but they burn all the other Hebrew literature. Was there any evidence of a Karaite uh, influence there? Sorry, I didn't think you were talking about the Hebrew Bible. No, I'm not talking about Karaim. Were anti. Right, that's why. I was yeah, but I, I don't know any involvement. I did. I didn't run into any current uh, issue concerning uh, Wolfgang or Pepperfield. So I don't know that. And second, brief question. So, are all of Wolfgang's works in Latin available online? Uh, a lot of them are in Spiegel, for example, is in German. And this expert opinion is in German. Oh. Um, although it was probably it was submitted in Latin, officially it should have been Latin. But it's interesting, we don't have the original submission. I don't know why we don't have it. We only have the German version, which is in the average figure. Uh, it's something that we still have to check because then you should ask yourself, what about the other submission, the universities and people from Calvin? And so I think it's we still have to check to think and to check about it. Yeah. Okay. And this is online, the Augustine? Uh, yeah, you have online, uh, I'm almost sure you have the, I know the English. You have one of the English translation line, and I'm almost sure you have the German translation line as well. I'm almost sure, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.